Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for today's plenary. Um, today, we have Dr. Rohan Arthur speaking to us. And to introduce him, we have Vardhan Patankar, the program head for the Marine Program at WCS India. Vardhan. Thank you, Marianne. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. And welcome to the second plenary of SCCS 2020. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rohan Arthur, who is a senior scientist and founding trustee of the Nature Conservation Foundation. Rohan obtained his master's in wildlife sciences from the Wildlife Institute of India in 1995. For his master's thesis, he worked on coral community composition and its responses to human disturbances in intertidal reefs of Gulf of Kutch, whereas for his doctoral thesis, he worked on the consequences of temperature-induced mass mortality of corals in Lakshadweep Islands. After his PhD, he worked briefly along the Kenyan coast, and for the last two decades or so, he has worked in several reef systems around India, which includes Gulf of Kutch, Gulf of Manar, Andaman Nicobar Islands, and Lakshadweep Islands, which is very dear to him. Besides, he is involved in leading a wide range of cutting-edge interdisciplinary research in marine ecology, conservation, global climate change, and socio-ecology in Indian waters. Currently, his research group conducts a wide range of basic and applied ecological and socioeconomic studies on coral reefs, seagrass meadows, and other marine environments. Rohan truly believes in power of observations of natural world and has a strong commitment to advancing the cause, cause of uh, field-based research in marine environment. He's also amongst a handful of senior scientists, or at least that's what I know, who regularly participates in field work and conduct collects their own data. And with his years of experience and efforts, he has managed to generate a long-term data set on the trajectories of coral reefs of Lakshadweep Islands. Through discussions, interactions, and hands-on training in conducting field research, he has trained an army of marine biologists. And in fact, I'm one of them. I was fortunate to get Rohan's guidance for my PhD while I was studying coral reefs and socio-ecological systems of the Nicobar Islands. Rohan has many accolades to his credit. Uh, and he has received many awards and grants. He's the only Indian to receive the prestigious Pew Marine Conservation Award to better understand uh, the contribution of fish to reef resilience. He's also amongst a few in India who has gone through rigorous CMAS to star scuba diving training, which is uh, perhaps much uh, rigorous than recreational diving. And though Rohan is modest about this fact, he must have easily logged more than 2,000 to 3,000 dives for conducting his research across different seascapes of the country. Besides his deep passion for marine conservation, he's a multi-talented and multifaceted individual who's interested in music, history, philosophy, art, and literature. He's, he's a trained musician, fantastic singer, a voracious reader, and extremely good with English language, and has a philosophical take on, on uh, almost everything that he says and he talks. So on a lighter notes, as his students, we often joke that reading Rohan's email is enough for you to prepare for GRE or to fill. So if you are someone who loves literature, reading, writing, et cetera, et cetera, then do follow Rohan's reviews on Goodreads. It's worth reading it. With this brief note, sit back wherever you are and enjoy Rohan's talk as he plunges deep into his work of conservation of marine environment. Over to Rohan. Thank you. Should I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Vardhan, thanks for that completely unjustified uh, introduction. Okay. As I had a couple of nasty things that I wanted to say about you, but I think I'll reserve that for later. Perhaps it was the end of the meeting. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let me get rid of these things. Yeah, we can see your slide now, Rohan. Perfect. So first up, Thanks a lot for inviting me to the SCCS. It's an honor to be finally able to attend. I mean, I've heard such a lot about the conference, um, 
that I and, and I really wanted to attend each year, but I've never been able to uh, to make it. So uh, yeah. you know, it's an. Before I go forward, I should say that this work is not is not mine alone. It belongs to a whole host of people who have uh, accompanied me along the way over these last few decades. And, uh, many of these people listed over here are people I've discussed the ideas inside and out with, okay? Some of the ideas that I presented today, they agree with, others they don't, okay? I also have to apologize in advance to people in the audience who have heard these stories before. They're the only ones I have, okay? We live in dystopic times. Okay, surrounded by the daily horror of what is unfolding around us. The pandemic brought home the existential vulnerability of our species. As one of my favorite poets, Don Marquis said, there is always some little thing that is too big for us. And yet I don't see the current pandemic as all bad. As people close to me will attest, social distancing is, is, is pretty normal for me, pandemic or not. And I, I see it as a blessing, not a curse. Another advantage of this pandemic is that it makes a mockery of geography. We can be any place, any time as we, as we surf the ether. And so even if I'm stuck here in Spain, okay, in an attic, okay, uh, the virus has allowed me to uh, finally attend the SECS. And so I suppose that's something to be, uh, to thank the pandemic for. As you can see, I'm, I'm generally an optimistic guy. I mean, uh, it takes a lot to, uh, it takes a lot to, to phase that optimism. I can find, uh, positive lessons in even the blackest of circumstances, right? uh, which is why I think I need to explain my title slide a little bit better. I'm trying to... All around us, we see decline. Most of our conservation stories take this overall shape. Okay? They are messy and all over the place. Yet the trend is clear. As environmental stress increases, our systems go uh, through some kind of uh, pattern of decline. Just one minute, I'm just having some difficulty with the screen. Sorry guys, just a minute. Okay, here I am. So all we, you know, we see this pattern of decline pretty much everywhere, okay? They're messy, okay? But the trend is, it seems to be really relatively clear as environmental stress increases, our systems, whether they're endangered species, their ecosystems, our social ecological systems, et cetera, are all moving on a downward path. We are in the business of documenting decline and extinction. Increasingly, there's a growing, push, uh, a growing push not to focus on the trajectory of decline at all. You know, decline is actually banal. We know that if we take fish out of a pond, there will be less fish in the pond. There are no lessons to be learned here. Okay, so what we need to do is focus not so, on the, so much on the trend, but on the variation. And when we do, we will see that a few sites, for whatever reason, they outperform. They, they buck the trend. Take a look at the sites, at these sites closely. There is more to learn uh, from the few positive deviants than from everything along the trend line. If you find out what characterizes these locations, we may get valuable clues on what we need to do to transform the rest and make all of them, all the rest of those red points look like these outliers. This is clearly powerful. And there are now plenty of papers that are being published, which are identifying these so-called hope spots, locations that for some reason or another are doing much, much better than expected. Let me be clear. I actually believe that looking at positive deviance is among the most important tools we have in today's conservation toolbox. If we have to make strides in conservation at a global scale, this is an approach that we will need to embrace much more seriously. What I'm less certain about is the growing imperative to focus only on these stories of hope. Humankind cannot bear very much reality, it seems to say, as T.S. Eliot said. People suffer from reality fatigue and they need a break. We need to focus on the positive. Positive messages sell better. They capture more eyeballs. They get more conservation funding. This appropriation 
and commodification of the heartfelt spirit of hope is what I'm uncomfortable with. I believe it has its dangers. It has its dangers for how we understand change in social ecological systems, for how we communicate this change to the world, and for how we choose to manage these systems in the face of change. And to illustrate my point, I will tell the story from my own little window to the world, which is the Lakshadweep Islands. For those of you who don't know, the Lakshadweep Islands are in the Northern Indian Ocean. They look like little specks on your windshield. I don't know if you can see it on your screens. So I'll zoom in a little bit. And when I zoom into the islands, they still look like uh, little specks. Okay. And that's because Lakshadweep is a, a small, uh, is one of the smallest chain of archipelagos that run from the Chagos, uh, north via the Maldives, along the Lakshadweep Chagos Ridge. It's 12 coral atolls in total, uh, about 32 square kilometers of land. It's a really tiny area, but it is densely populated. More than 70,000 people who've been living here for, more, for at least a thousand years. So I first started formally sampling the Lakshadweep in a time of crisis. It was 1998. There was a huge El Nino raging across the seas coming to us from the Pacific. And it was the most intense that anyone had recorded before. This was unprecedented. From reefs around the world, reports started emerging of a rare phenomenon uh, that was starting to occur on, on reefs called mass bleaching. Now, just a, a little side note about bleaching itself. Essentially, the coral, the coral animal, is it's an animal that gets about 90% of its nutrition from a little symbiont that lives uh, within its tissue called the zooxanthellae. It's a dinoflagellate. So under conditions of stress, the symbiont leaves the coral, leaving it completely white, okay? And the coral itself can survive a few days or even a couple of weeks without its zooxanthellae. But after a long time, it essentially starves and dies. A small amount of bleaching is actually normal in every reef. If you go to a reef and you, and you swim around in it, you'll find uh, you know, a few coral that is always bleached because they're going through some kind of stress. It's a, it's a standard disease response. But what people were reporting in 1998 was that as sea surface temperatures rose, almost all the coral on the reef uh, was bleaching and eventually dying. So I rushed to the Lakshadweep with the monsoons fast approaching and I wanted to see how the reefs were faring. I did not manage to sample too many reefs, but what I saw was dramatic. Reefs everywhere I looked were bleached as far as the eye could see. It was, it was quite a dramatic and uh, you know, uh, shocking sight. And as I said, I couldn't sample too many reefs, but when I was finally able to get back to the islands, a lot of this coral was dead, nearly 80 to 90% of it in some places. I was witnessing essentially the death of an entire ecosystem. And all that was left was to, was to write its epitaph. In the years that followed, a depressingly familiar picture was emerging from the rest of the world. To read the scientific papers of the time, reef after reef was declining to climate change with very little hope of recovery. Scientists who were once you know, just dismissed as, as prophets of doom were now being taken seriously. Coral reefs may not survive the new century. Some predicted their complete demise by, by as early as 2030. So it's against this backdrop that I started my PhD with the conviction that I had chosen an ecosystem to study that would go extinct in my lifetime. It's not a very happy place to begin. So I went back each year to try and document this extinction. And we've been going back pretty much every year to document that extinction. But somehow the Lakshadweep reefs were not behaving as I expected them to. If they were dying, it was a, they were dying in a very messy way, in an, an almost exuberant way. It took a while, but by 2004, already many reefs had actually begun a process of quick recovery. This recovery was not uniform, but as the years passed, instead of a standard decline to extinction, which is what I thought I would be uh, documenting, I found that the reefs in Lakshadweep were doing something much, much more interesting. Okay, it seemed that there were actually more ways to respond to global catastrophe. Some reefs went through these dramatic shifts in coral cover through time. They collapsed each time there was a mass beach event, but then they recovered pretty quickly. They tended to be the shallow exposed reefs that were battered heavily by the Southwest monsoon, which in itself was interesting. In contrast, of course, other reefs continued on a steady path to decline. And so they, after the bleaching event, there was a small, uh, shallow recovery, but they didn't really do too much. Uh, they were recovering pretty well, didn't, didn't recover very well. They just continued a steady path to decline. 
And finally, many of the deeper reefs showed a completely different pattern, which remained more or less stable through time and didn't really change too much. And so my team has spent the last, you know, spent the last next years frantically trying to understand these differential processes. You know, what differentiates a dynamic reef from a stable reef from a declining reef? And uh, what, are the, what are the consequences of these differences for coral as well as for fish? One, one important element of this recovery was how the coral settle and grow after each bleaching event. Uh, once the coral dies, it's not that it just breaks up. The reef is full of all this dead coral, which are all of different forms. So you have you know, dead standing coral, which is either branching or tabular or encrusting, various or massives. Uh, all these different forms are there on the reef, but they're all dead. But these structures soon get colonized by coralline algae. And coralline algae is what new coral, the new coral recruits when they come out, when, they, when they're uh, uh, recruiting on the reef, they seek this out and they want to recruit. So for new coral recruits, these old dead structures are great recruitment substrates. And what we found was that juvenile coral seem to prefer some structures over others. Now, these recruitment structures actually differ quite a lot between them in terms of their physical stability. Uh, some like the dead branches, they quickly broke up and they turned into rubble. So within a couple of years, all the dead sanding branches would just break, break up into rubble and then they'd roll away. Others like the, like the tabletops would stay for a few more years, but eventually they were toppled over with waves or storms. So we can organize these structures in terms of their structural stability, which is what the x-axis here is doing. Okay, uh, BF platform is the most stable, okay, and uh, the unconsolidated rubble is the least stable. Uh, the y-axis is some index of choice, okay, and the dotted line shows you no choice at all with anything below is coral being avoided, anything above is the, uh, being highly selected. What you can see is that for young recruits, the tabletop corals, these old dead, dead tabletops were actually highly selected. Recruits seem to prefer these, uh, um, these tabletops, as well as the massive coral. Many of these other coral forms were actually uh, avoided as much as possible. However, as these individuals grew, the ones that chose stables just didn't do very well at all. So despite being great as a recruitment substrate, some of these structures were just terrible for post-recruitment survival. And so these differences between where corals chose to recruit and where they survived was a really important part of the puzzle to, uh, to distinguish dynamic from stable from declining reefs. For exactly the same amount of recruitment and settlement, reefs could have very different trajectories to time based completely on the structural stability of the recruitment uh, structures and how new uh, recruits settle on them. So if you think about these three, three trajectories and what it means in terms of habitat structure uh, on these reefs, okay, you'll find that um, in terms of structural change, they have very different signatures. So we measured that and you can look at the rate of change uh, through time on these reefs and stable reefs have very little structural change. They have exactly the same structure through time. Okay, through, through the years, they have exactly the same structure. These dynamic reefs in contrast, which are changing all the time, they have a huge amount of structural change as well. So as live coral increases, their structure increases. With every uh, bleaching event, their structure dec uh, decreases. And for species that are trying to make a, a living on these reefs, these different st uh, stability regimes makes a big difference. And so we looked at that a little bit and tried to figure out what it means for uh, coral reef fish. So Rucha Karkare for her PhD looked at how this influenced a, a guild of, of reef predators, the, the groupers is what, the, what she chose to study. Many groupers are, are long-lived and they defend small territories on the reef. For these long-lived benthically associated species, structural stability is what matters. Their biomasses were highest on the most stable, the slightly deeper sites. Dynamic reefs, even though they recovered really well, were not great uh, for these species at all. If you live long, uh, having things change around you is not, is not good. And uh, I just want to see what we, how we're doing with time. And while we found this, this trend for groupers, we did other studies with long-lived butterfly fish, which showed exactly the same patterns. Thus, you know, for the, uh, for the ability of a, coral, of a coral reef to actually recover, which these dynamic sites, sites showed, did not actually translate into the recovery of fish communities at all. Okay. 
After doing these surveys for several years, we were actually able to test some basic assumptions of ecological theory as well. So uh, I'm simplifying this hugely, but one of the assumptions of neutral theory is that uh, all species are more or less equal and that species identity does not matter much. What this means is that the, uh, the natural rates of colonization and extinction should not vary between species. We could test this in our, with our data set by checking rates of colonization and extinction between species of different trophic groups. And what we found is that the probability of colonization actually followed pretty much what we should expect from neutral theory. There were no real differences between trophic groups. In contrast, extinction rates clearly increased with trophic level, okay? So if you were a herbivore, you had low rates of extinction. As you increase your trophic rate, you had higher and higher rates of extinction. So apart from adding a bit more nuance to neutral theory, what these trends suggest is that independent of any other factor, uh, higher trophic groups are just inherently more susceptible to extinction. So the trends we were tracking, while not exactly positive, were pointing to a broader, much more nuanced picture. Unlike many other reefs in the world, the Lakshadweep was showing an unexpected resilience. And we had to ask the question, how come? While most other tropic, tropical reefs uh, they, that were, were showing these dramatic declines, many of them were places where there were huge amounts of local human pressures on the reefs. Okay. In most of these reefs, human dependence on the reef fishing was extremely high and commercial reef fishing was, was rampant. Now, fish are, are, are critical elements on reefs. They, they help keep coral predator numbers down and they maintain reefs clean for, for new recruitment and growth. Having healthy fish population seems to be critical to reef resilience. Herbivores in particular uh, are, are very extremely important. And for all the changes that we were recording in the reef fish, uh, the fish community itself, particularly herbivores, were doing actually pretty well. So on the face of it, this was strange, given that the Lakshadweep has one of the densest human populations in rural India, and it has a strong economic dependence on the ocean. So in order to understand this, what our team needed to do is to take our heads out of the water and to look a little bit more closely at how people in the Lakshadweep related to the sea. To do this, we have to take our narrative back to the 1940s and, and, and earlier. Fishing in this time was not a commercial activity at all. Fish were never bought or sold. At the most, they could use, be used as an exchange commodity with your neighbors. Fishers were all largely artisans who fished with nets, with lines, with harpoons in the lagoon, in the reef, and sometimes in the open pelagic waters close to the islands. And this was the situation pretty much until the turn of independence. Little after Indian independence, the Indian government was determined to make the Lakshadweep a full contributing member of the Indian economy. The Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute uh, set up shop in the Lakshadweep and they spent a good deal of time exploring various options for resources to exploit. The obvious answer was actually staring them in the face. The vast Indian Ocean with its inexhaustible stock of pelagic species was there for the taking. It was in their reckoning being seriously underexploited and that was criminal. The species of choice was the skipjack tuna. Over the next few decades, the Lakshadi Fisheries Department set out to create a commercial fishery where none existed before. They did this with training programs, subsidies on boats, subsidies on fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was highly successful. And many artisans uh, took to the commercial fishing of, of skipjack tuna using the Poland line method that was being used in the Maldives and in the southernmost uh, Lakshadi island of, of, of Minikoi. And this program has actually been marvelously successful. As a result of this, for at least one generation now or more, the commercial fishery in Lakshadweep has been exclusively tuna. Tuna dominates the economy. And for most of us who've been in the islands will know it dominates the cuisine as well. You get tuna for breakfast, you get tuna for lunch and for dinner. Uh, one happy consequence of this is, uh, is that the dependence on the reef has declined dramatically. The artisan has been completely subsumed and the economy is completely dominated by the commercial fishery for the pelagic fish. So there we have it. The Lakshadweep reefs were not heavily fished because of commercial uh, tuna fishing. What is important to note is that this fishery was not begun to conserve the reefs, but to promote, promote a commercial enterprise. If there was ever a win-win situation, this was it. Lakshadweep was a clear outlier if only by accident. 
you know, in fact, I often suggested that we could use these islands as a reference site for the Indian Ocean, while other reference sites, for instance, Chagos or Lion Islands were completely unpeopled. We were talking here in the Lakshadweep of, you know, of a place which had 2000 people per square kilometer. Okay, and we had plenty of people living happily off the sea, but without compromising the ecological integrity of their reefs. This was a much, much more realistic way to imagine climate resilient, you know, resilience. This, if anything, was a vision of hope and optimism. And I should probably have stopped the story there and moved on because things changed. The first time we noticed the change was in 2013 or 14. We were busy studying a curious, extremely high density spawning aggregation of the square tail grouper in one of the most remote islands of the Lakshadweep. But when we surfaced, we saw for the first time fishing boats catching groupers from the reef. There was a large collector boat parked in the lagoon and fishers were taking their catch and selling it to these collector boats. This was the start of a commercial reef fishing in Lakshadweep. What started as a few collector boats soon grew and grew to many. Each year there were more being added to, uh, to these boats. They came with ice, they took back reef fish and took it back to the mainland. Over the coming years, reef fishing has increased first slowly and then rapidly as more and more fishers came to recognize how easy and how profitable it was to sell their catch directly to these collector boats rather than spend all the time processing it processing the tuna. Right now, Lakshadweep is on the cusp of a major transformation. Given the choice, fishers on average choose to fish the reef nearly 70% of the time. From being almost exclusive tuna fishermen, within a few short years, just about five or six years, the fishery is on the verge of completely switching over. What happens to this catch? If you look at what is being consumed locally, it's about more than 30 species of reef fish are being, that are being caught and eaten. They constitute less than 5% of the catch. The bulk of it is limited to groupers, snappers, and emperors. And these are not actually eaten locally much at all. Instead, these find their way to ports on the mainland, to, uh, to Mangalore, to Calicut, to Cochin. And we lose track of what happens there. Some of it is probably sold locally, but the, the bulk of it is probably going into some export market. I'll admit that this change, when it did occur, it took me completely by surprise. This, this was not part of my happy Lakshadweep narrative. Okay. And I'm still sort of grappling with it. And why did this change occur? Well, we're still trying to figure out the drivers of this change, but the reasons are, are reasonably clear. Around 2010, profits from tuna stocks became in, increasingly unpredictable. Um, the collector boats were offering fishers instant cash for reef fish, fish which was a blessing for a society that was uh, increasingly moving away from a credit economy towards a, uh, towards a cash economy. Earlier, only commercial tuna fishers with motorized boats could fish. And now, every fisherman with a small boat could go out into the reef. It's not a very, it's not, uh, you don't need high technology to fish the reef. You don't even need too much of expertise to, uh, to fish the reef. And so it's diversified to the fishery, okay? First, you needed to have a large commercial uh, boat to catch tuna. Now, pretty much anyone can do it. Although the price differential between tuna and reef fish has actually reduced considerably from 2014 when we first saw the fishery, selling reef fish to mother boats still reduces the processing time considerably. And these resource patterns are changing each year. And each year that we go back, things are changing just a little bit and we're still trying to make sense of it. Okay, but this is a familiar tale. We've heard it all before in one form or another. Things remain stable, some large unforeseen thing happens and the system moves on to a completely different trajectory which we scramble behind trying to understand as it unravels. And I think if we are willing as conservationists and as ecologists to only deal with history as a series of these external disturbances, contingent events, okay, we will be forced to tell all our ecological stories as a sequence of meaningless contingent events, full knowing that these events are eventually the most important agents structuring our system. And I, I mean, it's easy to see why this is, right? Most of our ecological theory is an attempt to Im impose this ahistoric framework on an essential, essentially what is an, a historic process, 
history is messy and it doesn't fit well into our equations. We don't like it, okay? Yet I think we can make true advances in our understanding of social ecological systems only when we acknowledge that the study of historical processes is central to predicting social ecological outcomes. Now, this is not new. This is not, I mean, it's bold, but it's not new. It's something as, as old as Karl Marx. Back in his day, Marx boldly tried to take on the, the challenge of predicting history. And we, we all know that it was an effort of limited success. But, but Marx has other bits of wisdom to offer, which are, which are worth reconsidering. One of them is the idea of the commodity within the free market system. One of the consequences of committing to a global free market system is that the weight of capital and the need for value to constantly flow is so strong that it'll reach everywhere eventually. So with this in mind, what if I was getting this whole story of the luxury fisheries wrong? Perhaps the question is not why the reef fishery is taking off now, but why it had not taken off earlier. What were the barriers to commodification all, this, all these years? And with that in mind, it means revisiting my simple story of resource use of the Lakshadweep that I told you. It's a story that I've taken for granted all this time. And it means going back, not to the 1940s, but to roll back the world to the 1800s. And if I do, I suddenly realize that the social structures to support the commodity market were already deeply entrenched in Lakshadweep society, except not for fish. It has been, it's about coconut. Coconut has always been the mainstay of the Lakshadweep economy. Its social system and its rudimentary caste system is built around the ownership, the harvesting, the processing, and the processing and the trading of coconuts. These coconuts were harvested in large quantities, processed for coir, and they were shipped in large sailboats to the mainland, uh, largely in exchange for, uh, for rice and other commodities. It was a relatively primitive commodity setup, but the basis of a commodity market was already in place around 200 years ago. Okay. So this sets the stage for what comes next. The society, the societal structures already are well primed to adopt a commodity market. So when we get back to the post-independence in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, the barriers to commodification uh, on pelagic fish were actually merely just technological. Once the fisheries department had actually solved this problem by providing boats uh, and training, the local found, the community found it very easy to adopt. The plantation owners, the ones who owned uh, the coconut trees, okay, uh, are the ones who bought the subsidized boats. These were the koyas. The coconut climbers became the fishers on these boats, the melia cherries. And the sailors and the traders, the malmis, either joined the boats or continued trading. Tuna and coconut, even though they look very different, are actually very similar. They both need a certain amount of processing. They both can be stored for long periods of time uh, after processing, and, they can, uh, and then they can be taken to the market. They can be packed together and taken to the market. And they are both, therefore, very important elements of the credit economy. Pelagic fishing does one interesting thing. So the, the fishing for tuna doesn't, it, it, it does one interesting thing. It removes an important barrier in the process of commodification. It changes some vital social norms. Fish were previously only seen as food, but now fish can be seen as money. Once its use value is, is replaced by an exchange value, of course, all fish can now be seen as potential exchange. However, the barriers to commodifying reef fish were much more difficult to overcome. In the 1980s and beyond, it was full of the, all these failed experiments to try and commodify different reef products. The CFFRI did a whole range of exploitation potential studies of everything from seaweed to sea cucumbers to coral to sharks to everything. And many of these experiments were tried. We, they were, uh, you know, uh, experiments have tried to commodify uh, ornamental reef fish. For a few years, bump-headed parrotfish were being iced and shipped out on flights. And all of these, for one reason or another, came, uh, you know, they came to nothing. So the switch, when it actually happened, happened for banal proximate reasons, the kinds of reasons I've been telling you about. You know, I don't think those reasons are really that important. A few years of fluctuating profits from tuna, a few collector boats arriving from the mainland with ice in their holes, okay? and a community that is moving towards the cash economy. It was 
the reasons for this commodification would go all the way back to the 1800s. It was a process just waiting to happen. The central message of the open market economy is that everything is a potential commodity. Every element of fungible nature is a commodity in search of a market. Many elements of non-fungible nature can be made fungible as well and then commodified. If it has not been exploited yet, it is only because it has, it has not yet found its true market to be united with. Okay, so to look at the Lakshadweep story once again, to recapitulate, the process of commodification began several centuries ago with coconut being the principal commodity of exchange, reef fish still belonged to the, to the realm of food. In the 1980s, another resource enters the commodity market, which was tuna, because it was essentially only as valuable as its exchange. It is more or less equal to the coconut. And as I said, that changes the social norm, which then makes this process of the of commodification very easy, where reef fish enters the market economy, okay? where there is a complete equivalence between coconut and tuna and reef fish, which is of course the universal exchange, which is the rupee. Once this process of commodification begins, there is a very little hope of it of crawling back. Everything, as I said, is commodifiable and it is just a matter of time before the market finds its way to get past the barriers of commodification. Before the pandemic, the big push on the Lakshadweep was to commodify the island itself by developing tourism in a big way. Okay. And so looked at within this frame, it is completely and perfectly understandable why reef fishing began in this uh, rampant way uh, a few years ago. And what's happening on the reef in the meanwhile? The reef has been going through some major changes. We analyzed two decades of change in, uh, in coral cover in the Lakshadweep. Uh, we've had three ma major El Ninos in 98, 2010, 2016. We think that 2020 is an El Nino year, but we can't really be sure whether there's been a mass bleaching or not because we have not been able to go there. Uh, each of these El Nino years has actually been worse than the other. The good news is that each El Nino saw a much less percentage mortality of the coral, suggesting to some extent that the coral assemblage is getting increasingly resistant. However, the post-mortality recovery after each event has changed dramatically. After 1998, the recovery was uh, rather smart, as I showed you. But in the years after 2010, we've had a dismal rate of recovery. At current rates, it should potentially take around 30 years without another disturbance to recover to pre-1998 conditions. However, just to remind you, mass bleaching events are occurring once every four to five years. So having 30 years uh, without a bleaching event uh, is not something that we should, ex we should hope for. And the decline of the reef will eventually have consequences on the land. Don't take these results very seriously since they're extremely preliminary. But our initial work seems to suggest that the beaches on the capital with more than 13,000 people living on it are beginning to erode. Over the last two decades, it may have lost some 10% of its land area. So that's where we are today in the Lakshadweep. It's not a very happy story and there's not much to be optimistic about. And so I return to where I started this talk, the growing insistence to tell stories of optimism in conservation. It is based on the assumption that the public is, is inured to tales of disaster. An earlier generation of change makers believed that all that was required to shake people out of their comfortable slumber was to get them organized for social and ecological change. Rachel Carson in the United States, Mandana Shiva in India are just two such examples, okay? Today, conservation optimists will tell you their voices would be largely ignored because their messages are much too gloom laden. Also, as conservation becomes more corporatized, we need to show success stories, stories that are saleable as commodities that people, governments, global corporations would buy. Countering global doom, we are told, requires selling the idea that there is still hope for ecological transformation. That's how, how conservation gets its funding these days. We need solution-driven conservation, we are told. Conservation is a set of neat disruptive ideas that can be applied everywhere, preferably within the three year period that projects last and before, before funders lose interest. My fears are these, by accepting conservation as a marketable commodity, we subject it to all the vagaries of the market. 
with all its known structural flaws. It shifts the burden of conservation from something which I believe conservation should be, which is real, place-based, people-based and need-based. And we shift it from something that, that is all those things to something as ephemeral as a packaged product with a price that can be traded and whose value can be negotiated and exchanged independent of geography, time and ecological context. My fears are these as well. Optimism makes us fo focus on the outliers. It is an intellectually appealing idea, of course. But the idea that outlier analysis can lead to large ecological transformations everywhere, because all we need to do is emulate the outliers and we'll be fine, I think is a naive oversimplification for most places. The norm, I strongly believe, exists for a reason. There are always strong social, political, environmental, and historical influences that limit the degrees of freedom of social ecological systems. Communities do not want to over-harvest their resources. Politicians and bureaucrats do not want to destroy entire ecosystems and livelihoods with ill thought through schemes and policies. I truly believe this. And even the average business person does not want to rapaciously overexploit the natural resources on which she builds her business. Anthropogenic, anthropogenic ecological decline is almost always, I think, the product of completely justifiable circumstances within which human communities, markets, and ecological systems exist. For the majority of the world that does not belong to the fortunate outliers, we need to engage much more deeply with the ultimate drivers of decline if we have to find ways to modify these trajectories. I do not claim this is going to be easy, nor do I claim I know how to do it. Social ecological systems are complex. Trying to figure them out is going to be difficult. Harvey Marx writes of the several moments or levers that keep the global economy in motion. But I think many of these identified levers can be modified to social ecological systems as well. And very briefly, these are things that we are very familiar with, like the modes of material production, resource harvest, technology, institutional frameworks. These are things that we are actually, we, we know where about. But it also includes human relations to nature, okay? Our daily life, the, just the daily quotidian activity of daily life, mental conceptions, how we make sense of the world, our social relations, our relations to one another. To these, I would crucially add ecological dynamics that bound them all, because all of this needs to be bounded within, an eco within the ecological dynamics. Uh, and all of these function together in a globalized world, working at different rates and at different scales, interacting in complex ways. And all of these are firmly set in the history and geography of place. It is an understanding how all these levers work together that we have our best hope in conserving natural resources and systems in a sustainable and in a just way. What is important to recognize about these levers is that while many of these belong to the realm of the material, several of them belong to the mental. We as ecologists and as economists are actually pretty comfortable with the world of the material, species, habitats, technology, etc. We are far less comfortable in the world of the mental, which we don't, you know, where which have to do not so much with material relations, but with relations of the mind. The tools exist uh, uh, for us to study them, but we are much less equipped to use them. Not all of these are instrumental tools, and it might require us to become very different kinds of actors in the system that we care about if you have to be agents of change in them. I'm not claiming this is easy, but moving our attention back to the norm allows us to focus once more on the multiple levers that matter to get things right. Whether we have the ability and or the agency to manipulate these levers is quite another question, which we will have to debate using respectful, informed, and democratic processes. I think one of the biggest challenges in our field of conservation advocacy is recognizing under what conditions to act and when not to act. Allowing ourselves to, fear, to fail and allowing ourselves to retreat, I think will be signs of a mature conservation practice. I don't think we're there yet. 
for the first decade of my work in the Lakshadweep, I've I always thought of it as a place to be optimistic. Dense human population, still resilient reefs, despite several mass breaching events. The second decade shifted that trajectory completely, and I've had to completely reevaluate the kind of social ecological system the Lakshadweep is. The Lakshadweep is shifting very much towards the norm. And my engagement with it has to be deeper, more nuanced and multifaceted if I have to understand it and be an agent of change on these islands. I think the current pandemic has important lessons to teach in how we understand and communicate, the, uh, communicate crises. Through all the chaos, it is showing that if we commu communicate clearly, urgently and transparently about the true gravity of the situation without any packaging, people can and do respond. I think as a conservation community, we need to find a way to do that without giving up on hope. Finding that balance is not right, but I think it is not, it's not easy at all. But I think we need to strive towards that. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Um, and I have many more, but maybe I can ask you mine later. Um, so the first question is from Farida. How does the local community respond to this change? Do they understand what's happening to their reefs and how it will ultimately impact them? So the whole idea of being stakeholders, et cetera. So Farida, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think that um, when we think about the local community, we think of it as one, one solid block, but actually that's not true at all. The community is as nuanced as any community is. And so while there will be uh, people within the community who clearly see this change as something to be concerned about, uh, for the most part, the fishing community in the Lakshadweep is embracing this change with a huge amount of enthusiasm. And you would understand why that is. Individual lives are getting better. People are getting richer in the Lakshadweep. Uh, fishing is extremely profitable. It's becoming even more profitable today. Okay. So the dangers that I might see as an ecologist is not what individual fishers are likely to see uh, from their perspective. And that's perfectly understandable. Thanks, Rohan. Um, the next question is from Uma. She says, thanks for an interesting talk. I have a couple of questions, maybe simple-minded. Um, one is that you spoke about stability and structure initially. Do these stable communities have a higher number of species? So you're talking about the stable reefs, right? Yes, right. that's true. Uh, the, stable, the stable reefs, when it comes to uh, many of the fish communities that we've been looking at them, whether they are uh, they're predators, whether they're, uh, they're butterfly fish, whether they're, it's pretty much every group that you look at, these stable reefs seem to have much, much higher, uh, much, much higher diversities. The next part of that question is you spoke of two factors affecting reef communities, climate and fishing. From a historical perspective, is there paleo data on the impact of climate and fishing? Is there any way to tease these two factors apart and their effect on reef communities? So yeah, that's that's interesting. To uh, short answer about paleo data, uh, looking at the, the effect of, uh, of fishing and climate change, there are studies that are coming out right now from other reefs. We don't have it from the Lakshad Reef, of course, but from other reefs, there has been, uh, there have, it's beginning to, uh, to, uh, uh, to emerge. The difficulty in most reef systems, of course, as you rightly pointed out, is sorting out the effects of local anthropogenic stresses from the climate uh, signatures, right? And that's always been the difficulty, which is why you typically go to these places where you don't have any human habitation, where apparently fishing does not take place and you don't have any of these other, you know, uh, messy local factors that are, that are affecting things. Uh, the the Lakshadweep, we've always argued in the past, was a place where we could do this because reef fishing was so low that we could assume pretty much that what was happening, this was as close as you could get to a pristine, uh, pristine reef system. Now things have changed. Now we have to account for, uh, for reef fishing as well. And very briefly, what we, you know, what we are seeing is that you know, uh, 
local anthropogenic change, okay, local anthropogenic stresses can clearly affect uh, the patterns that we're seeing, and they can often be the biggest signature in the pattern that we're seeing. But uh, climate change, okay, can affect, it doesn't know any boundaries at all. So your marine protected area, for instance, is not going to, affect, not going to influence your, uh, you know, where coral reef bleaching is going to take place, for instance. What it can do, however, is potentially help in, in giving the reef significant amount of resilience, and therefore the recovery in reefs uh, that have higher fish communities, for instance, may potentially be better. We don't know this from the luxury, but this is from studies elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have any further questions yet from the audience. So audience, if you have any questions, please type them out into the Q&A tab. Um, but I'll ask mine. Uh, you talked about the about COVID and you know what we're seeing right now. So two questions around that. One is during the pandemic, we've seen the importance of localized markets since some of these export markets collapsed and therefore had implications for people's livelihood and economy. So do you think there's an opportunity? I mean, do you know what's happened in the islands because of the collapse of these markets to the reef fishery? And is there an opportunity now to have this conversation about resilience and the importance of localization? Um, and the second part of that is you also talked about the lessons for communication, right? That, that COVID has taught us how we can communicate clearly. But I was just wondering, is it important who does this communication? Um, so is it as simple as the communication needs to be clear, um, but do we also need to reflect on the legitimacy of who is making this communication? And do you think there's a difference there in how when the conservation community communicates versus say, governments or WHO or some of these organizations? Two uh, very complex questions, <laughs> Marianne. So the, I'll take the first one. Uh, and look, in the immediate aftermath of, of uh, the COVID lockdown, what happened in the Lakshadweep is that the large collector boats were not allowed to get onto the islands, right? And so, Initially, what we are, you know, just from a, from a short term perspective, uh, the reef fishing had actually stopped for a fair bit. Okay? Because the, 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 what is important to understand in the Lakshadweep, the, 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 um, the reef fishing that's taking place right now is that it has one weak spot, that it is for essentially for live, uh, for fresh fish. And the fresh fish basically needs ice and it needs, um, it needs boats to be able to take the, uh, take the fish back to the mainland. And that is the one thing that limits everything, that uh, limits the commodification of the reef fishing in the Lakshadweep. And so uh, until now, reef fishermen would not go out fishing unless there was a collector boat around, right? And so that, is the, you know, that was the one little bottleneck. Uh, during the pandemic, these uh, reef fish were not, these uh, collector boats were not coming to the islands and therefore reef fishing had, had stopped. But I think that we don't, I mean, the, the reports are quite scarce. It's difficult to get them right now. I haven't been able to get to the islands. But from our, our contacts on the islands, it, fishing has begun once again, and occasional collect, collector boats are going back to the islands every now and again. I think this is, this is a, a a resource use pattern that has become entrenched already. It's very, very much an alternative that fishing that uh, fishing communities, once they see it as a possibility, are not going to sh shift back from. So if anything, we'll have to find a way forward, not back. And that basically means some form of self-regulation uh, and getting the local community to organize around uh, this new fishery that's emerging. And I think the time to do it is now before it gets completely out of hand, okay? Um, and who does it, of course, I, I suspect that it may have to just be the local community that organizes because they are the ones who have the most amount of agency and they are the ones who, will, who you know, have the mo who have most to lose from this. So to get to your second question, the business of communication, uh, I think it needs to be pretty much everyone. I think we need to communicate that, that, that there needs to be a coordinated communication. Uh, the who we are really decides uh, how we communicate and, and the legitimacy of our message. You're right, right? But I think that we as scientists need to be much, much more open about 
the so-called objectivity of our positions. Okay, we aren't objective about our positions, and as conservation biologists, we certainly aren't objective in our positions. Okay, we are apparently a crisis discipline, right? And so we leave our objectivity behind by the at the moment we call we put the label on ourselves of conservation scientists, right? Uh, which in itself is an inherent contradiction within conservation biology itself. But that's another thing altogether. But I don't think that we should be ashamed of that uh, lack of objectivity. Okay, we recognize that we have a stake. Okay, in the in the debate, we have a particular voice, and I think that local that that communities around the world are capable of dealing with that nuance. They're capable of recognizing that this is a stance you are taking. Okay, and eventually they will listen to you as long as they believe that you're honest about that stance. And I think that that transparency and that honesty needs to be communicated. We far too long have been treating science as some kind of an ideological position. Okay, almost like a religion, and that I think you know either has divides the world up into believers and non-believers. I think we need to move beyond that. Okay, this is not about belief and non-belief. This is about communicating message clearly, and that's about all. And I think that's the, that's the that's the direction that I believe that we should be taking. Thanks, Rohan. We've got a couple more questions coming in from the audience. Um, apart from fish and coral reefs themselves, do we have a sense of what might be happening with other marine invertebrates in the Lakshadweep? So the impacts of bleaching or removal of higher trophic orders from the ecosystem? Short answer, no, not at all. <laughs> I wish that we did, okay. Uh, there's a lot to left to be uh, to be understood in terms of the ecological unraveling that's taking place. My my general sense is that uh, the system is shifting to a different set of functions altogether. Okay, I might talk about this as some kind of an ecological decline, but that is just a I think that's that's uh, probably. Um, you know, an irresponsible shortcut. What is happening is that the system is moving to a different ecological state. And I'm not sure whether that is better or worse. It is just a different set of functions. Okay. So I said that, you know, many people are predicting the, the uh, extinction of these of coral reefs in 2030. I think that is not going to happen. What's going to happen is that uh, ecosystems are going to be transformed. A new set of functions are going to arise. Okay. A new set, so a set of winners and losers is going, to, uh, is going to take hold in the system. Okay. And I think that what we need to do is to, uh, to understand, to embrace a little bit more what uh, Peter Mumby calls mediocrity in reefs. Okay. And we need to understand what this mediocrity means. And if anything, we need to worry about what it means for human, uh, for, for the way humans use the system and what it means for the, uh, for, uh, for the existence, for the existential values in places like the luxury, which are completely dependent for its existence in places like the luxury. But that's a long winded response, but essentially when it comes to the rest of the ecosystem, beyond the coral and the fish, I haven't done any work. Our team hasn't done any work, but lots of work needs to be done. Thank you. Um, we'll take two more questions. So the first is from Aditya who asks, can reef fishing be banned as it's still early enough? And isn't coconut and tuna um, sufficient for the local economy? Or is it for the local economy? Can reef fishing be banned? Uh, no, I'm sure it can be banned, but I don't know whether I would recommend it, it being banned. I don't think it, we could ever make it effective at all. Mm -hmm. I don't think that legislation uh, plays much of a role except in disenfranchising local communities. Local communities are essentially responding to, uh, to, uh, to uh, their own circumstances. Okay? And I don't think that our responses to the fact that you have an ecosystem in, at threat, okay, our responses should not be to really legislate this. Okay? Uh, as I said towards the end, we need to know whether we have the ability to move those levers of social ecological systems, whether they have the agency to move those levers in social ecological systems. 
And I think that is very, very critical to understand that we should be extremely careful before we think about moving any one of those levers because I can go home and sit in my attic in Spain. We can go and sit in our, in our uh, houses in, in Bangalore, but we don't, we don't have to deal with the consequences of the everyday existence of, uh, of living in a place like Lakshadweep. And therefore, I think we should be very, very careful before we think about um, doing things like, you know, like uh, blanket bans on, uh, on many of these resource use patterns that are emerging. What we do need is to start conversations with local communities. Uh, we need to get them organized around what is now pretty much a scramble fishery. And uh, once local institutions are created, I think local communities are perfectly capable of being able to handle these systems on their own. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question, which is actually a little bit connected uh, to what you were saying about we need to recognize that um, our role as conservationists and how this isn't a religion. Um, so the question is from Ridula, who's asking, is there a reluctance on the part of ecologists to engage with political and historical questions at their study sites? And could that be the reason why there is surprise when these commodification events or changes occur? Well, I can't speak for all ecologists. I can speak for myself. And I have to tell you that I, I had to be taken kicking and screaming to understanding uh, these systems. I was quite comfortable, you know, putting on my scuba tank and going underwater and looking at these systems there because this, this is the system that I understand best, okay? Uh, I can take my little slate and I can go and write little notes about what's happening with the coral and what's happening with the fish. And uh, it's, it's my comfort zone. So for me, myself, it took a long time to recognize the importance of these historical events. Um, but more and more, I think ecologists are coming to embrace the fact that environmental histories are, are critical. Uh, most of, our, of the clues of what is happening in systems uh, actually exist in history. Uh, it, they exist in history and they exist in geography. So while from the perspective of ecological theory, we don't really have a good way of building in history, uh, except as disturbance, okay? Uh, I think that more and more we are coming to embrace the fact that, it, that it's something that we need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take one last question. It's from uh, Suman who wants to know if there's been any recovery in the coral because of the lockdown, as we've been seeing all these reports of nature recovery. Um, in general. So Suman, it's, it's very, it's too early to tell, okay? Uh, and I suspect that it's gonna take longer than just a, a one year of a lockdown. Most of the patterns that I was talking to you about have taken place over 20 years. And so recoveries in reefs will, you don't expect to see a post bleaching recovery for about four, five, six, uh, nearly 10 years. Okay, before you can start seeing these recoveries taking place. So um, what, you know, as I was, ex uh, I was responding to Marianne's question earlier, that one of the short term effects of the lockdown is that for a little while, uh, fishing on the reef may have reduced a fair amount. Okay, whether that continues for much longer, we don't really know. Uh, beyond that, you know, to be, to be actually completely honest, after March, I haven't been able to be uh, in the islands. So I don't really know uh, what the situation is, but as with everything, okay, uh, time will tell. Okay, so we, we'll have to see the consequences of this within the next five or six years. Great, okay. Um, thanks Rohan, I dropped out for a second, but clearly uh, no interruption. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. As you said, the silver lining is that we could host you here at SECS and we really appreciate you taking the time and I think your con your talk actually has been a really nice segue from the plenary um, from Asmita yesterday because she talked about shifting gaze uh, and in a sense you've given us an example of how you shifted your question from looking at the change but then understanding to then understanding what was the barriers that prevented the change um, up till now uh, so and as well re-emphasized her um, I think core message, which was that conservation is inherently political and we need to understand that we are not objective um, participants in all of this. 
Thanks a lot for inviting me. Sorry, I think we've lost Marianne again. Uh, okay. But again, thank you so much, Rohan, for joining us, uh, especially all the way from Spain. And we hope you will be able to join in, in physical form conference in future years. Thank you very much. And it was a very Rohan. easy, it was a very short trip to, to come and join you. So it wasn't that difficult. <laughs> OK, that's great. And a big thank you to all our audience, obviously, who participated and asked questions. Um, thank you very much. Marianne, take over. <laughs> Thanks, Nupal. This is the challenge of working um, on the internet. But um, yeah, thank you. Um, the next session is Who's Who. So um, viewers, you can head to the Who's Who tab and engage with the organizations there. Thanks once again, Rohan. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. See you, Rohan.